Hello. Oops. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Good. I'm getting a crowd in here today, right? Hello. Hi. Hi, Boris. <laughs> hey there. Let me see. Ah, okay. One second. I was still coding and then I was like, oh my God, it's already. <laughs> cool. No worries. Um, yeah. If you want to present, that's cool. Otherwise, we'll wait about five minutes. Um, yep. Um, I'll, I'll just get my affairs in order and then um, we can get started. Uh, so I didn't really prepare anything formal. Um, as I expected, it's more of a kind of Q&A or overview session without too much of a structure, right? Okay. Yeah, that'd be fine. Okay, cool, cool. Okay. Or I, I mean, just you you can all let me know what, what is most useful from your side and I can just try to uh, explain as much of PromQL as I can um, in the amount of time we have. Um, but I'm maybe... Curious, uh, mm -hmm. I was going to... I'm curious how much has changed since you uh, had joined us at New Relic to help us with the PromQL translation stuff. Oh, you were at New Relic. Hey. Yeah. Uh, well, oh, you mean like in terms of PromQL itself or? Yeah, I'm just curious with the, the presentation, like just kind of walking through PromQL and how it was and how it is. Did I did I give like a, this 90 minute style overview talk back then or? Something similar, although it was more definitely more nitty gritty Q and A because we had a lot of pointed yeah. questions with our translation code. I, I, I do remember that. Yeah, that was a bit of a tough project because NRQL was just so different from PromQL. Um, and yeah. then trying to kind of shoehorn PromQL on top of it was 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 a tough, uh, tough thing to do <laughs> from both sides. Why can I not resize this window? Okay, give me a second here. Dip, dip, da, da, da. Well, should be should be okay. Um, I think I'll just use this one. Okay, so for the crowd who is here, um, how's the distribution of PromQL knowledge? Does, does, does Do most people have like a rough idea of what it is or should I start at zero or just at some of the, like what, what's the frame, Chris? What, what do you think is best for this? Yeah, I think um, you can assume most folks are familiar with PromQL since it's okay. a major group. You know, okay. the most popular language in the yeah. metrics landscape. And what we'd be looking for this session is really kind of um, some of your thoughts about where the language came from and uh, some background about why it was developed and how it was developed, um, some of the main goals of it, kind of going over that uh, interview form that you had filled. Right. Okay. Then I'll also just bring that one up. Um, okay. Then let me share. Um, then I will not go into all the nitty gritty details. Um, so, wait, did I, sh oh, I shared the wrong one. One second. Da, oh, da, no. da, da, da. <laughs> and I for everybody want... else, please uh, join or fill in the attendance if you don't mind, please. I'll paste it in the chat. Um, and then just a quick intro here while you're getting set up, Julius. Uh, welcome to Observability Standards uh, Query Language Working Group today. Um, we're um, blessed to have Julius here, who's one of the co-creators of Prometheus, um, to be able to present about PromQL and 
kind of help us uh, answer any questions we might have about the language um, as we're kind of looking and surveying all the different observability languages um, to look towards a standard. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. And Julius, go ahead and take it away. Yeah, thanks for the invite, Chris. Um, so yeah, Chris asked me a while ago to fill out this form. Um, so all these questions are from the standard form um, from your tag observability group. And uh, I think this first section is maybe the most kind of relevant, right? Uh, the, the overarching goals that we had back then in 2012 with Prometheus, and I think one of the, the most important things is that Prometheus is old by now. <laughs> so we started it uh, like 11 years ago, coming from Google, coming to SoundCloud from Google and kind of missing Google's Borg mon monitoring system. And uh, we really needed it. We just needed a good or decent open source monitoring tool to do our job. And so we really focused on scratching our own itch and, hey, let's build a time series based monitoring system that marries together the time series metrics collection aspect uh, kind of, you know, storing everything as highly dimensional data with this new kind of data model that has labels and not just a either completely flat metric identifier or um, a graphite style hierarchical identifier where it's kind of hard to add additional um, components in a flexible way here and there all the time. So this label-based data model was new and then we wanted the language to be really focused on these common metrics-based systems monitoring use cases. So we were not trying to solve, for example, high-frequency trading data or something like this, right? We The set of functions and the data model and, and all that that we wanted to support was for that kind of cloud-style systems monitoring use case. Uh, I think someone still has their mic unmuted. I, I hear a little bit of of like background noise there. Ah, now it's gone. Perfect. Um, so I think that that that's that is an important point, right? We didn't try to solve really every use case under the sun. I think a lot of the the initial success of Prometheus that it was was that it was was quite simple and focused, right? It it came at a good time when we fully open sourced and announced it um, in this Kubernetes time, uh, where people were looking for a monitoring system to monitor workloads on Kubernetes because it was so dynamic and you needed service discovery and a dimensional data model to make sense of things. But also Prometheus was kind of focused. It didn't try to do logs and traces and other things than metrics and other use cases than just the, the normal systems monitoring. Um, and yeah, we also write the, the idea was we want to collect time series data um, for ad hoc querying, but we also want to be able to base dashboards on the query language and we want to build alerts using that query language. I think by now it's again, you know, a pretty standard concept, but back then you had these strict separations. Um, most people had like Nagios for alerts in their org and they, you know, Nagios didn't really have um, a time series view of the world or a query language where you could... Uh, formulate alerting expressions at flexible aggregation levels over your entire system, taking different signals into account and correlating them and doing or even doing math between them. Um, so that brings me to the next point, vector math. And I think vector math is in combination with Prometheus's dimensional data model, one of the most powerful things in PromQL, where it allows you to do correlations or arithmetic between two sets of time series. So you have one list of time series and another list of time series. And somehow you kind of almost automatically join them up on con uh, on um, compatible label sets, either completely compatible label sets, or you have ways of kind of choosing a subset of the labels you want to match them on, um, or you know, allowing many to one matching, one to many, and so on. Um, but then, you know, doing let's say ratios from that, or adding a bunch, uh, one number, one set of numbers to another set of numbers, or filtering one set of number by an equivalent other set of numbers that might contain thresholds or so. Um, so that I think was a completely new concept outside of Google um, back then. And uh, I think that's 
both a really cool part and that makes it easy in PromQL to express um, in a brief way this kind of automatic automatic join type of math between sets of time series. But it's also one of the kind of downsides where it's easy to shoot yourself in the foot if the data doesn't quite match, if the label names don't quite match, if there's like an additional label name on the other side and you're not accounting for that and all these things. So it's also a sharp edge of PromQL. Um, but yeah, that was one of the initial goals. Like we wanted to have that kind of feature. Um, PromQL tries to be relatively terse, right? Even in, in those binary operators slash vector math uh, things, um, if you wrote that as a SQL style join, you would be writing a lot of like trying to match a lot of column names to each other and so on. And in that kind of, you don't have that so much in PromQL. Um, PromQL itself, you can only use to read data, right? So you do not write data with PromQL. Um, that happens over a totally different path. Normally, it's the scraping route or recording rule that writes some data into the TSDB. And deletion of data happens automatically after the retention time has been reached. Um, and alteration of data normally never happens, although we do have some, um, some APIs if you need to do it. Um, so it's really just a functional language. You just tell the TSDB what it should calculate and you get back some result, but it doesn't change anything. Um, at least the initial set of functions and still the current set of functions uh, is pretty simple in terms of the analytical capabilities. So we always resisted um, putting too much kind of magic or machine learning or anomaly detection in quotes uh, stuff into PromQL. Um, mainly to keep it simple, um, normally also when you base alerting rules on constructs, those constructs should be relatively simple for you to still understand the alerting rule and reason about it. That's at least the reasoning behind this kind of philosophy here. I know some people see it differently and we're, we're probably going to be more open in the future in PromQL. Like we had a long discussion about that recently for, you know, potentially allowing more functionality in PromQL. But by now, like, the the number of functions and functionalities we have is like still strictly geared around this whole systems monitoring use case and and the more simple stuff you want to do there. Um, and yeah, when you write a PromQL expression, and if I just you know jump to any PromQL expression input field here, um, let's say I write some expression here, then in this expression itself, you will very rarely find absolute timestamps. Um, usually you will have some kind of durations here, like, hey, five minutes worth of data to consider for a rate averaging calculation. But the absolute timestamps, whether it is a single absolute timestamp for an, a tabular query or multiple kind of um, time steps at regular resolution steps, they come externally. So they are not part of the PromQL language, but they're sent as a, a separate HTTP parameters to the PromQL evaluation API. Um, and um, so this expression here is always evaluated at one timestamp at a time. That's the evaluation timestamp. So right here, right? Um, or in this graph kind of view, and if I make the resolution really visible, then you can imagine this expression being individually evaluated first at this very first time step, then at the second time step, then at the third time step, um, with these time steps kind of not even knowing about each other, right? So it's kind of this, uh, yeah, the... This, the system where the absolute timestamps are kind of out of band parameters and all the relative, uh, all the stuff in here is relative with very few minor exceptions. There's an add operator now that allows you to put some absolute stuff in there, but that's not used often. So I think these are some of the most um, important characteristics of the language or design, design decisions as well. Um, does anyone either have additions to that or any questions about that? I do have a quick question, which is um, now in retrospect, since the language has been around for a while, mm -hmm. do you how do you feel about the decision to make it so that range queries versus instance queries are done kind of at the API level instead of within the language? Would you have changed that if you had come back to it? 
Oh, it's a good question. Um, I I do not want to put absolute timestamps into the expression. Um, first, because it makes the expression less general, but also because it makes the expression more tedious. Um, so I, I do kind of like that. But what other systems do have is in their type of range query, right, is that this step between... Um, between output data points, so the resolution step that I set to 300 seconds or uh, five minutes here, so the step between those two points, uh, that this also plays into the data selection window of how far do you, kind of how much do you roll up data between those two points. And we do kind of, you know, for, for us, this is always completely um, orthogonal or separate like you can choose whatever selection window up here and um, let's say I had a 10 minute resolution time step then at every step I would only select half of the steps worth of data to play into my rate averaging right like at this step here for example for this time series I would only look back kind of to the middle of the, re the, the resolution uh, step to select all the raw data points falling under that um, that uh, five minutes window, although the resolution step is 10 minutes wide. And so I would only consider like half of the data between these two points to uh, kind of inform my rate. So I, I, I can run into the danger of skipping over half of the data where there might be a huge rate spike, for example, that I'm then not seeing. Uh, so I'd have to, in this case, be careful to choose my resolution window at least as large and ideally even a little bit larger than the resolution step um, to cover potential increases in the counter value from the end of one window to the beginning of the next window. Um, and in Grafana, this is kind of solved with a special variable. Um, it's called rate interval. It's not a PromQL construct. So here it will show up as an error. Um, but yeah, bringing that kind of concept a little bit more into PromQL proper could have made sense or could maybe still make sense. I'm not sure. Yeah, that's that's Where, the main reason I ask is because, yeah. yeah, there's there's some interesting nuances that happen with the roll-up size and auto-completion and, you know, and it also makes the language a little bit more difficult to export because like a NERCL, like the, the time series keyword is just part of the language which does turn it into a range query versus a instant query. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of interesting that like the copyability of the string containing the entire execution context of like how it's being interpreted um, being different than, than PromQL where you actually need a little bit of extra metadata to get the full re reproducibility right. of the query's execution. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Just, an, just an interesting know. difference. Yeah, totally. And you, you could view it the other way around as well, right? Like what I said initially, it, it's more general. If I don't put absolute times in there, like you can then just take the expression, the prompt right. expression and run it at your custom times very easily. <laughs> um, but yeah, it comes with a, yeah, it's, it's a double-edged sword. Yeah, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, like most of the time, this um, resolution thing that I just mentioned is not really much of an issue because people's uh, averaging windows tend to be larger than the resolution time step, except when you get to like really large, um, uh, yeah, really uh, quite zoomed out graphs where then the resolution time step is at some point will be uh, larger than what you provide here. Um, unless you in if you're in Grafana and you use the rate interval variable, you're usually fine anyway. Um, but if you're in a pure PromQL environment, then that, that at some point could bite you. But it's 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 more of a thing that is philosophically a little bit different between this language and most other languages, I guess. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because yeah, in Nurkel. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I just don't want to. <laughs> But if I may ask, uh, do you plan any extension of uh, PromQL, such as MetricQL, from uh, from Victoria? Because they're a little bit more powerful. Uh, so, hey, wanna... mm -hmm. so, I mean, I, I guess the difference between Victoria Metrics and Prometheus is that Prometheus has been, it's an open governance project. Um, 
not a company. And so we've always had a bit more discussions and have been a bit more conservative about adding certain features, especially a lot of the features that Victoria Metrics did add were very questionable to people in the Prometheus team. Um, I can't even speak to details, but for example, there were long, long, long discussions about the rate implementation, for example, and Victoria Metrics offers some other rate implementations um, and the way you select data in range vector selectors where Victoria Metrics always selects one additional data point before this window. So you always have that sample from the previous window um, in your rate calculations. So you don't have the issue of like, there could be a large increase between the last sample of one window to the first sample of the next window that you're missing. Um, but a lot of those decisions were kind of made very quickly and in a more centralized fashion in Victoria Metrics that was where we also not sure, like we, we would actually um, welcome um, kind of, I don't know, so they, they never really um, engaged in a contribution kind let of me put, let, me, uh, let me Let me put it this way. I'm yeah. not a, a user of uh, Victoria Metrics, but yeah. I see uh, a trend when some people start to move to uh, this language only for mm -hmm. one reason, because it's a little bit more enriched and more intelligent. They yep. provide like, some functions that you can't. It's a, by the way, for some uh, degree correlate with what you said before, why you do not provide ML or any other functions on the fly. It's just a, this is a beauty that you do not provide. And this is where you have some significant gap compared with um, with some uh, vendors who are capable to provide this stuff. Yeah, I mean, some of the, for sure, could make sense. Other stuff could be more contentious in terms of, yeah, this is a good feature for some users, but also causes issues for others or will make it easier to misuse some stuff. So some stuff is maybe a bit more contentious. Um, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, um, generally, I think we want to be a little bit more open in terms of what functions and functionality we want to add. I just saw a pull request today from Julian in the Prometheus server for adding a feature flag for experimental functions in PromQL because we had this discussion recently that we want to try adding more functions in an experimental way at least. Um, to have them for users to try out and then keep the ones that don't really cause issues. So for sure, okay. there's going to be functionality in prom in metrics QL that could be good to have in PromQL, but we also want to like not add, you know, the, the question is always like, if you add features to a product, um, some make it better. But if you add too many different things that are not, well enough thought out, then over the long term, you might create a language that's a little bit too messy or so. But I, I totally get your point. Like there's definitely features in there that that could make something <laughs> happen Prometheus. I'm just trying to say for the at least for previous four or five years, mm -hmm. using only one prediction function across language. And uh, I understand you shouldn't uh, waste your resources. So just uh, it should be approach that would work for everyone. And probably uh, looking how open telemetry project is doing, this is the right way to do this. You have experimental part, you just put this and uh, you can see how people would. Uh, OK. Um, yeah, I mean, that's that's kind of the plan, I would say. Yeah. yeah. OK, sorry. Um, again, can't promise that specific features will make it into the language um, because it's still a bit more conservative as also in an open source project with an open governance, you have a bit more of a design by committee uh, thing than, you know, one one company and one CTO saying we're going to do this now. <laughs> that has pros and cons. Um, but definitely we, we do notice that and we, we do want to be more open. Yeah. So another question kind of on that mm -hmm. point, uh, the evolution of PromQL, what are your thoughts or um, some of the folks that you know in the Prom community around um, expanding Prom to support other telemetry types like logs and traces, profiles, um, kind of looking at some of the work that uh, you know, the folks at Grafana have been doing with 
uh, Tempo QL and the yeah. uh, Wall QL. I have so no idea really... about those. Yeah, I'm not a good yeah. person to... I mean, I know that in Prometheus, we most likely will want to keep it focused on metrics. Uh, I think the overarching question is more, should there be an observability query language that tries to marry everything together, right? Um, I've, I've definitely heard people tell me like, no, 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 that's not a good idea because they, they, they have very different needs, these signal types. Um, but I haven't thought much about it myself because I've, I've been living so in metrics land that I'm, I'm a bad, sp bad spokesperson about that topic. But um, I, I know, of course, there's um, log QL, like the tempo thing, and there's um, uh, trace QL. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, for, from I, both from Grafana, um, kind of PromQL inspired, but different around logs and traces. Mm -hmm. but well, because one aspect... so, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yes, please. Oh, yeah, just uh, real quick. Um, one aspect that we've been thinking about is, um, I mean, those, like you said, they're inspired, but one, we have one concept of trying to unify all of the formats in some way that you could query across them. Some folks don't like that, like you said, because the use cases can be different. But on the other hand, there's the uh, syntax and semantics that are common mm -hmm. around particularly labels and filtering, um, potentially joining yep. on some of those that could yep. be shared. Um, so I guess the question would be what, I mean, on that aspect, do you think there's room to kind of formalize some of the selection side and then leave other implementations up to each telemetry type and database? Um, and a follow-up would be, how do you think, what would be the best way to engage the CROM uh, community around this topic? Yeah, I, I, I think this was actually my thinking um, around the data identifiers like labels, and other names, um, it totally makes sense to have similarities in concepts and also to, you know, especially when you have the same labels for logs, uh, sorry, that Loki is the log database in Grafana and Tempo is the trace database, right? Um, and often these have um, kind of labels attached to them that are compatible between metrics, logs, and traces, so you can jump between things. And I think for that, it totally makes sense to come up with um, very similar, if not completely compatible um, constructs. Um, I, I guess, you know, of course, you will have some more metadata in one of the signals, like traces, than in metrics. Um, but as far as possible, that, that makes sense to me. Then when it comes to calculations and stuff like that, like, then it maybe makes more sense to have more a bit different different functionalities and features and not really have it all in one language um, but these selections yeah um what was the second part of your question oh how to engage um i i think in general the best way to engage with prometheus yeah that's a good question so one thing you could do is if this is like a really complex discussion you would want to have at some point. So we we usually ask people to send a mail to the developer's mailing list, which is reasonably active. Um, if they have like some more complex um, proposal that involves discussion or, you know, community opinions and so on. So uh, using the developer's mailing list is a good start. We also have uh, regular dev summits. These are like usually two hours online meetings, I think every six weeks or so. Um, the challenge with those is like everyone can join, not just Prometheus team members, but um, there's a, a big backlog of things that people would like to have discussed. <laughs> so sometimes it might be challenging. Like if you can put yourself in, the, in that uh, document, but then it could be challenging to kind of actually get your turn that day. Um, but I think the developers mailing list is always a good good start. Um, in terms of PromQL, like I'm not that involved in designing or building much on it myself at the moment. So it's, it's more other people actually building the engine and kind of extending it at the moment. Um, but yeah, um, one thing that might be relevant is that uh, on a recent Dev Summit in Munich, this was an in-person one, um, the team decided or like most of the people in the room decided that with open telemetry just becoming more and more relevant um we want to make prometheus and promql more compatible with open telemetry 
Um, so, you know, both um, have better support for open telemetry metrics ingestion and metadata handling because that handle happens a little bit differently there. Um, and also extend PromQL and Prometheus' data model to um, have uh, label names that support all UTF-8 characters, for example. So like we have to introduce some kind of escaping scheme there. Or so there, there's some proposals out for that. So we're already kind of trying to get more compatible with the OT world. Um, and yeah, may, maybe that is relevant uh, in this case as well. Although OT doesn't really specify query languages, but query languages have to be somehow compatible with their data model at least. I see that Vijay is uh, raising a hand for a long time already. No, I, 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 I was just waiting for you to finish, sorry. Ah, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, go ahead. Yeah, so I think uh, uh, I, I really liked uh, hearing the last part where uh, uh, eventually uh, uh, everything with the open telemetry schema and whatnot, uh, along with data types, everything is going to be supported in Prometheus. Um, at that point, uh, uh, do you see PromQL as something that... Uh, um, grows beyond the scope of just uh, Prometheus in the sense that is there any uh, room for PromQL to become a standardized language in itself that can support multiple metric backends uh, rather than just uh, Prometheus? Yes, it can always be highly optimized towards Prometheus, but uh, this is something that a lot of people today just use remote right to achieve, mm -hmm. but uh, can can PromQL plug more natively into any data source, which could facilitate extending into logs, traces in the long run, because more or less it's the most consumed language today. Um, yeah. Uh, should it spread uh, so, its wings even further? I, 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 yeah, good question. I, I don't see it currently anything on the horizon for logs and traces or other signal types than metrics. But for metrics, it's already very common for all kinds of systems to have PromQL either 100% compatible interfaces or ones that are that try to be. <laughs> I I did like a whole. Uh, if you go to Prom Labs, I have this section here um, in the resources around uh, the compliance tests that I ran a couple of years back. I kind of stopped doing it, um, but here you can see some. I have a, a test suite with many test queries and. Um, the score is not 100% informative because, you know, sometimes um, in case of Victoria metrics and others, you know, there, there's incompatibilities, but you have to look at like the real details um, of the test cases to give you an idea of, you know, how bad is it? If I go to, I don't know, an example here, for example, um, you can see why a certain test failed or passed. Um, but yeah, there you can see here, there's many different systems already that are not vanilla Prometheus, but that support a either fully or almost PromQL compatible interface. So I think that that part is already happening. But the extension to different metric, uh, to different signal types, I guess that's what we talked about earlier, whether that makes sense for one query language to try and do. Um, I, I don't think PromQL itself wants to try and do that. Um, if others want to try and do that, um, that's... Yeah, <laughs> be my guest, but uh, maybe it makes more sense to kind of standardize, as Chris said, around the selector aspects only. Thank you. All righty, any other things? Um, let's see, deficiencies. Oh, I have uh, one question. Uh, so first of all, uh, I think the question is very great, uh, or the, the language itself. But I also have some questions about the, the functions. Mm -hmm. uh, you, I know you were uh, inspired by Borgman and uh, using graphite. Yeah? Uh, more metrics-based, uh, more from, let's say, less availability monitoring to more performance kind of things. Um, but how did you look at the various ways, for example, how to standardize this language? Because you chose a, a certain method. You see other methods, like how can you execute it, like pipe-based queries. Uh, how did you came to this format? Why did you choose it as a team? Was it a natural decision to make it a one-line way? Or wasn't it a way... 
how to do it for, for example, a pipe processing mm -hmm. language, like with K2L, the query language, and what are the benefits that you saw there? So really uh, the way how to execute it, to format yeah. the commands. So it's just yeah. about the syntax, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, to be honest, coming from Borgmon, Borgmon just did it like this. <laughs> it's just functional. Um, I guess, you know, when I build a query builder, for example, in a UI, I would approach it in a bit more pipeline fashion, usually, right? You start, you you want to have maybe, hey, let's select a metric and then let's do a rate and then let's do something, right? Like this. Um, until you get to the point where you want to do binary operations. Um, now, if I go, you know, if I look at an example here with a binary operation, um, now you get trees. Um, PromQL expressions can be arbitrarily nested deep trees. So I could take like this entire sub expression and put it here. And like here could be another sub expression, right? So here you can see the entire evaluation tree. And so at that point, even the pipeline based view would have to somehow split up. And Grafana tries to solve that in one way currently with, with its query builder. Um, but yeah, at some point it becomes kind of non linear, right? It's at least a tree. Um, and then with a pipeline style builder, this would be kind of like this tree, but coming from the right side of the screen <laughs> in, instead of the left. So I don't know if that would be better um, in terms of other, other than the whole binary operations uh, in, uh, introducing a tree-like view. Um, the question is, and not only binary operations, right? You, you can have um, a function with many parameters and um, though we don't have that many um and and then each parameter again could be like multiple sub expressions and so on um but yeah um other than that i think it's just preference um it does mean you have to jump around a little bit more with parentheses yeah that's maybe what's bugging you most i don't know <laughs> um, yeah but... that's that's one of the things and it's yeah. also the the Let's say the, the people, the users, the end users, the engineers, developers, how yep. to handle it, how to learn it. Yeah, it's, it's in some people have PromQL, it's hard, had a hard in learning uh, yep. phase to set it up. But in some case, when you get used to it, it's, uh, yeah, you know how to work with it, use functions like rate. So that's, uh, but I Important. think that's a different question again. Uh, yeah. That's that's uh, syntax versus functionality, right? Like, uh, if I if I did like this or a pipe and then a rate, then then it still doesn't tell me how exactly the rate. Yeah. Is. Um, but uh, the thing in PromQL is you usually start with the inner part of your query, like, oh, what's this? Okay, let let me put a rate around that. Uh huh. Okay, let me sum that up by path and do like this. And, you know, um, and yeah, and you saw like I jumped to the beginning at the end a lot in that case because I need those parentheses in the right places. And um, I still like to read it like that, um, but I, I totally get it. I, I, I don't have a big preference otherwise, like pipeline versus versus more functional. Um, just where, where you introduce binary operators, then you kind of introduce this more messy tree-like structure anyway. So, um, yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, other questions? I was I just it... thinking, oh, sorry. <laughs> I oh, was just ahead. thinking hard up, uh, let's say in my mind, you're now, yeah, it's mainly used oh, for querying, creating the dashboards, getting the data, alerting. It's also used for recording rules. Um, in some way, how can you also use it in a way that it's used to have what we already mentioned about correlating things between various uh, queries? Is this also where you look for this kind of use cases? I know there is partly you can correlate because of labels. Mm -hmm. But did you already, did you also have a specific uh, functions uh, for that? And did you also look at that to have certain uh, metrics correlated to each other over time? 
You mean like statistical correlation? Yeah. Automatically yeah, finding final. statistical correlation? Yeah, because that's nine out of 10. We are really looking at uh, this metric has, uh, let's say, impact on that metric. And sometimes you mm. want to correlate these things and not on a technical, mm. but on a, a more functional level. Mm. Uh, I'm really but you want to thinking. automatically you want to automatically find metrics that are yeah that you also had this use case there or was yeah. it mainly on the system monitoring side not on the call it uh, more yeah that goes a little bit into this kind of anomaly detection point that I discussed initially right um, yeah. this one here <laughs> which we decided to just keep things more simple um, not to do yet um, I. I think at some point maybe it gets a bit too data crunchy and heavy for what Prometheus, you know, those PromQL queries are also supposed to usually finish very quickly and not try to correlate every series to every other series that you selected and so on. Um, but if there's something that is helpful and that could be done relatively cheaply, for example, and is still easy-ish to understand conceptually, that could be something that is um, cool. Um, but yeah, so far, um, it's just kind of in the kind of keep things simple. We have a lot to maintain um, philosophy. We we didn't add that kind of deep, deep analytical capability yet. Yeah, Thanks. I guess a follow up to that, um, if you're all finished on it, sorry, um, would be kind of what is that threshold, do you think, for supporting more advanced um, analytics capabilities, whether it be a correlation like that or just a period over period or um, some more uh, smoothing functions you might implement in PROM. Mm -hmm. um, and how would you decide about whether or not it's worth it to implement in a database engine, um, the Prometheus itself, or support in language? And when do you decide to just push that off to another crunching system like pandas or uh, spark where you could exfiltrate the data from prometheus yeah yeah i mean so far we've we've i mean mo for most of prometheus's life we were more saying like we we don't do that in promql if you want to do that pull it out put it into a data crunching system do some advanced statistical analysis and then if you want to you can even feed the result back into prometheus um, nowadays, we're maybe getting a bit more open towards some things, but I think if it really gets data crunchy, we're still not too open to it, <laughs> uh, most likely. Uh, I mean, things can always change. It's open governance, um, but though, of course, there are, you know, people with certain opinions. Um, and and Prometheus as a core, also, right, the, the Prometheus server, at least the vanilla one, is like a single node system, right, that has to do collect all your system's data, not all, like you can have multiple Prometheus servers, um, but it does a lot of things already in terms of collecting data, running alerting rules and so on and so on. So this data anomaly stuff, if it gets too compute heavy, then a dedicated system for that would also make more sense. Um, but if it is something that is, you know, can be re relatively lightweight, then I could more imagine that to be potentially um, part of Prometheus itself. Um, yeah. So yeah, if, if, if you have something specific in mind there, for example, that, that could be part of such a single node systems monitoring system, um, that could reasonably quickly calculate a result based on the metrics data, um, without kind of crashing the Prometheus server, then that, that would be potentially an interesting thing to propose. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, yeah, and just to know, we are at time for the meeting itself, but if anybody else wants to stick around and has time to, if Julie and Lisa, you have a few more minutes to talk. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm flexible. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, for anybody dropping off who are joined late, please sign the uh, meeting notes, uh, sign in there, and then thank you very much for your questions. And, yeah, keep going if you all like. I'll hang out, too. I got to drop. See you all. See you for presenting. Sure. <clears throat>All righty. Any other questions? Well, I guess another question for me, too. I mean, I have a ton, of mm -hmm. course. But <laughs> yeah, enough you're free. I, I have time. It's fine. <laughs> have you or the Prometheus community seen much interest or a request for supporting SQL on prom data specifically? 
Oh, SQL on prom data? No, not 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 a lot. More the other way around. Like I hey, have uh, some other data, and I would like to prom queue a lot. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's quite common because like once you get used to kind of the quick. Yeah, especially like the binary math and all that stuff in PromQL, it's quite nice to be able to, um, you know, do it on stuff that is not strictly systems monitoring style data. Um, but yeah, the other use case around, uh, not much. I mean, Timescale, uh, which who you might know, this company Timescale, um, they they kind of have that as one of their main points. Like, hey, we are, have a com Prometheus compatible layer. Or at least they used to. They had this open source project that is now. I think they're focusing on other things now. But um, basically, that's this Postgres compatible main database that could do way more based on the Prometheus style data that you um, collect. And then the advertising point was there, like, hey, you can can do way. You can pull in other types of data as well more easily, uh, all with SQL with a standard interface. Um, but beyond that, I haven't had too much contact with that kind of request. Yeah. But it could make sense for certain types of use cases. Yeah, it does kind of seem like the observability um, world is kind of merging more with the BI and security aspects where they want to be able to join mm -hmm. these other data sets like maybe user IDs internally with the metrics that have their labels, those kind of situations. Yeah, which, or like uh, inventory, asset inventories and with, with right. all the metadata on specific devices or so. Um, like that was possible in in that kind of time scale system for example um another question kind of and you touch on with ashton there um helping him with the <laughs> integration of promql um and converting that to in rql um uh, and i've heard from a number of other uh, companies who've implemented promql layers or query layers on their existing uh, time series uh, databases, particular mm -hmm. metrics, is that the models are kind of different. And it seems like Prom's model of storing the counters came out of Google. I mean, I work on OpenTCP too, it was counter based as well. Um, I think it was based on something even before Borgmon there. Um, but now the industry has kind of moved towards storing rates because it's easier for the users to. Deltas, kind of, right? Uh, the deltas, yeah. yeah. Or, uh, Delta counters. Um, so is the prom model, um, I mean, you also mentioned in supporting OTEL a little more. Um, do you think the prom uh, QL model will be able to support these, uh, the deltas in the future in an easier way to reason about? Potentially. Let me consult my Dev Summit notes on another screen. Let me see. <laughs> because we, we talked about this at length. Um, in Munich, da, 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 da. let me see if I can quickly find it. Maybe, maybe it doesn't make sense for me to try and find it now. Uh, there was a long discussion in person about it, and uh, there was some kind of, in, in the whole hotel, larger topic area, um, some willingness uh, to attempt to also um, support data counts um, because hotel requires them right and and some vendors and some some systems require them including the new I, I think the new monarch google monitoring system right prefers delta counts as well if, if i'm not mistaken um i so. forgot about that but um there's there's definitely like nrql as well right um they, they do have some benefits in terms of you can eat more easily scale out distributed summing and then just sum the sum of sums together and everything works out <laughs> for those deltas mm -hmm. over a specific amount of time which is harder with with the kind of continuously going up counters in prometheus land uh, mm -hmm. where we didn't really have that problem in in our architecture um but yeah it could could be that we might support something like that in our ot compatibility layer in the future I would have to check um, to to give you a better answer. I, I can I can send you um, more info on that afterwards. Sounds yeah. like a politician, like on uh, you know when. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that's part of the when they're award. in Congress, like <laughs> Senator. I can give you that information later. <laughs> uh, well, and yeah, right now the nice thing is we're collecting data about these query languages, and then the mm -hmm. next step is going to be actually discussing. The pros and cons and that's when the politics gets involved so 
Yeah, the pros and cons. Yeah, and uh, yeah, there, there. I think the overarching pro and con is also just like you know, Prometheus at least has been fairly opinionated and ha has offered one way of doing everything in the metric space, at least. Um, and then there's the whole other approach of let's try to get everyone's needs into one system, which is more hotel like um, with the resulting complexity of design and slower implementations for client libraries and, you know, more to learn, but it serves more needs um, at the same time. So it's, it's definitely some trade-offs there. Um, and I, I guess you will run into the same thing when you're trying to standardize <laughs> an observability <laughs> query language. I, I don't envy you in that respect at all. <laughs> yeah, this is definitely the, kind of the outgrowth of Otel. So we're just looking yeah. to standardize the egress now if we can. Yeah, we can, we can yeah. Tools. Yeah, makes sense, makes sense. I mean, um, also uh, Otel always focused on the client library API aspect. Um, maybe... I know uh, Frederick from Prometheus and others say like, and, and it kind of makes sense to me, but maybe I, I don't know enough about o OT's original motivations, uh, whether it would have made more sense to standardize on wire formats instead first. Like this is the standard tracing wire format, but how you structure your client library, we don't care, for example, or this is the standard metrics format. Um, but of course, there are certain things that they wanted to standardize on, like what metadata is attached to certain things. That could still be part, I mean, can still be part of the wire format. Um, but if you, yeah, if you standardize the client library API, then it's also automatically in there already. Um, but yeah, mm -hmm. I guess now now we're getting even to the query language aspect um, of it. Right. Yeah. Well, I'm tied to that. I want to ask you about two. I mean, you noted in the specifically PromQL, it's not used for writing data. Exactly. X, uh, and we didn't. And I kind of like that too. I'm not a fan of using SQL to write and mutate data necessarily, although you know, it is what it is. But in OTEL, there's now the OTTL uh, language for transforming metrics. And I was talking to some of those folks at KubeCon um, and asked them why didn't you use PromQL or some other existing syntax and use that. And they were talking about um, trying to tie that so they could build an AST directly to the OTEL data format. Have there, in the prom community, has anyone approached you from OTEL or has there been any interest in adding some kind of DDL semantics uh, in the future potentially to PromQL? No, not at all. Um, that never, I, I don't think that ever came up in terms of mutating data through PromQL. Everyone always agreed, like, nope, that, that happens over totally different channels. <laughs> the closest uh -huh. thing we have to it is, of course, recording rules, um, where you do say evaluate this PromQL expression and save the resulting time series as a new metric name. It's not, it's a layer around PromQL, so it can be done. Um, but PromQL itself, the expression, mm, I don't think anyone ever wanted to do that. Uh, any, anyone wanted to that to be anything else than functional, I would say. Yeah, because just one of the biggest pains that customers typically face is learning all the different DSLs for all the different telemetry tools. Yeah, I, I get it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it is partially how I make my my living as well. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah. Yeah, I, I, I have to learn other types of tools all the time. Like now I'm doing more like front end development and stuff like that, other product development. And it's like, oh, get another React library or yeah. stuff like that, right? It's It gets tiring. Yep. Gotcha. All right. Does anybody else have questions? Uh, is there any part of the language that uh, you still feel that this could be done a lot better? Uh, I guess it goes a little bit into this one section here, weaknesses. And also let me share the link to this doc in the chat so you all have it. Uh, chat. Du, du, um, so I guess you can read these in detail. Um, yeah, the, the, the main thing um, is like that it's too easy to write an expression where the entire result ends up being empty, but you're unsure why. Um, for example, like if you go to PromLens and we go to one of these example expressions, 
and I break something like, hmm, I don't know, here I misspell a metric name, let's say, then I get a totally empty query output, but it could be for many different reasons if I didn't have this awesome prom lens view into my query here, uh, where I see what has zero results. Um, it could be because I'm doing the binary operating operator matching wrong. It could be that I'm selecting a too short rate window, blah, 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 blah. like many different reasons. Yeah. But the actual reasons in this case is that I misspelled this metric name. So here I can see it already. Like this node has zero results. Um, so if it's that deep in the tree and then everything else will automatically become zero results due to that. So this tool helps me spot it. Um, but without this tool, it's really annoying um, when I'm in pure Prometheus and I just enter this expression here and it's empty and I'm staring at it, um, then it's hard to figure out what is actually wrong. And so having some better built-in tooling, but then also, you know, could you have some optional typing or schemas um, that would help you try and detect those things a little bit better? Like if you're trying to you know, match up some stuff that doesn't match or select a metric name that is not supposed to exist anywhere in your systems or a label value that is not supposed to exist. Um, on the other hand, it's kind of nice that Prometheus is a more schema-less system because it makes data production really easy. You don't need to define the shape of your data before you just spurt it out and Prometheus just saves it and doesn't care like it just creates the time series the first time they appear um but having like typescript like maybe some optional typing and and safety guarantees around things could be helpful um that's just kind of very raw thinking from my side um and uh, let's see yeah the whole deep statistics stuff it's not really something i want to change much in promql um, but it, it's definitely something that, that some people are missing. Um, namespacing, I, I guess you all are already totally on that because <laughs> if I were to design a language nowadays, I would probably put more namespacing in there um, for like well-known metric names maybe or, you know, just a bit more namespacing features. We, we really don't have any of that at all in Prometheus. Um, so if you want to have something namespace-like, you'd usually just make it some underscored naming component of your metric name, for example, or your label name. Um, and yeah. Uh, other than that, there's not like this this one huge big thing that I would like to change about PromQL. Uh, what's your opinion about uh, uh, doing joins on uh, PromQL? Uh, I think uh, uh, internal to eBay, at least uh, that is one place where people need a lot of handholding on how to write proper joins. Uh, is there any uh, opportunity to simplify on that front? Oh, also, uh, excuse me, I already forgot that I had unshared my screen earlier. And so you all didn't see what <laughs> what I presented here because uh, I was showing like this example. Nobody saw that, then, right? And nobody uh, let me know. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, yell at me. Um, I, I hadn't shared, but this was my screen. And then I had like this this empty metric name here. And um, I was talking about how the PromLens tool helps me see where I get zero results and all that. I didn't have that <laughs> shared anymore. Sorry. Um, I, I thought I was still sharing. Um, anyway, uh, for the this question, um, joins. Um, you mean like, um making joins easier to understand or teaching them better or in in what uh, aspect right, yeah yeah easier to grasp right like if you do mm -hmm. a group left ignoring something blah 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 yeah. uh, uh, that it, from a from a mental model perspective uh, yeah it's definitely not very straightforward for a lot of people to grasp um mm -hmm. yeah yeah so that's, most common one would be uh, to do a join against, uh, say, cube state metrics mm -hmm. uh, to get some additional labels in and then do arithmetic uh, after that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, especially because it kind of abuses binary arithmetic operators to just pull in some labels from somewhere else, right? Where you don't right. really want exactly. to do math. You just kind of would maybe want to have an operator that's like a, a middle dot or something that just like joins get some labels from somewhere else, but doesn't actually add or multiply or something, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I think, I mean, there's no, there've been like minor requests for this around over the ages, I would say, but no current like push to, to make this better. Um, but it's, it's, I guess not a big reason because like people really don't want, want this to be better, but just because nobody's really behind it at the moment. Um, uh, I, I'm not sure if you could make it much better. Like the binary operators are doing a pretty okay job at it, but it's kind of weird that you need an arithmetic operator to just join in a label. Yeah. So yeah. if I if I were to redesign this or something like that, that would definitely be a nice thing to to have a little bit more um yeah explicit that I just want to join in something and not actually do arithmetic. And right. yeah, the, the naming of group left and group right is also, um, I guess you need to get used to it. Yeah. Um, I, I guess joins in most languages are a little bit confusing once you get to the edge cases where things don't quite match up. Um, but yeah, if you have suggestions for how to improve this in PromQL without breaking PromQL, <laughs> um, then, then that would be interesting to hear as well. Okay, sounds good. Uh, yeah, I think uh, uh, there's always opportunity to use a new PromQL function altogether and to see if there's a better syntax. Uh, yeah, I think you want to have this as syntax and not as like just a function. Um, but right. maybe, yeah, there, I, I know we have some issues somewhere around like making joins easier, but um, I, I don't know the details around that anymore. Um, uh, sometimes it's hard to come up with something really cool that fits into the rest of the language well enough to be accepted, I guess. Yeah. Makes sense. But Thank I you. also don't want to discourage anyone from coming up with something really cool. So what there's de is definitely a, a, a thing that makes the language a bit hard to approach for those use cases. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. All right, any other questions, thoughts? All right, well, once again, thank you very much, Julius, for taking your time. Uh, my pleasure. To join today and present, and I really appreciate it. Nice, yeah, yeah my pleasure, so anytime. <laughs> All righty. All and right. We'll get the recording up some point, and uh, yeah, thanks again. So have a great week, everybody. Cool. All righty, then see you all. See you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a good day. Bye. Have a good day. Bye. Bye. Bye.